Today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome a special guest, Professor Oswald Jarrett, to talk with me about feline leukemia virus. So welcome, Oz, and thank you very much for thank joining you. us. Um, would you like to tell our, re our audience who may not be familiar with feline leukemia virus just a little bit about how devastating it is to a cat who gets perm permanently infected with it? Well, it, it is uh, still um, a very devastating infection, uh, can cause leukemia and lymphomas, anemia, um, in cats that become infected. And cats that become infected, um, strangely, can be perfectly healthy and carry the virus for a long period of time uh, before they de develop a disease. The problem is that during that period when they're healthy, uh, they can transmit the virus via the saliva to other cats. And uh, so os ostensibly they're, they're healthy. Um, but they're a danger to, to other, other cats. Yes, and, and because of this, um, would you like to talk about whether they uh, transmit the virus to cats that they meet casually, or is it more a problem of cats in a household? Well, the virus has uh, evolved uh, within groups of cats. It really only survives in multi-cat households because the amount of contact that's required to uh, transmit the virus um, uh, only occurs in, in these households. Um, and the, the cats that become uh, infected most frequently are young animals, kittens or, or very young adults uh, in, in these households. In the cat in the street, uh, it's very unlikely to become infected because the amount of contact is very short and intermittent. So essentially it is an infection of uh, multi-cat households. So the cat in the street will mount a good immune response and become immune after a brief uh, exposure? Well we think so. We think that um, the only evidence of cats uh, becoming infected uh, is uh, because they have antibodies to the virus that shows they have been infected. But these sort of cats never develop, or very rarely do they develop uh, permanent persistent infections which is the dangerous state. Yes and the, for the cats who do become persistently infected what's their prognosis? How long will they live? Well it's quite variable, it depends on how much virus uh, they are carrying. Um, they carry virus in the blood which can always be detected um, and they will uh, usually live uh, quite healthily for a few years but most of them will die within uh, four to five years of uh, a variety of very nasty conditions. Yes. Um, my own interest in talking to you today is because, as you know, my big dream is to eradicate feline coronavirus and feline infectious peritonitis, which is caused by coronavirus. And I hold you personally responsible for the near eradication of feline leukemia virus here in the United Kingdom and earlier today you were telling me that the prevalence in uh, Holland and Germany is also decreasing. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about how that came about? For example, I believe with yourselves you started with um, the, the Abyssinian Cat Club in Britain, was it in the 70s or 80s? Well it became clear uh, from uh, testing for the virus and the first step was to develop diagnostic tests yes. by which we could detect uh, animals which were persistently infected and we found that when we went into uh, households of cats and often these were pedigree cats uh, we found that the um, a proportion of the cats would be infected and a proportion would not be infected and uh, this was a, a, a constant finding uh, with time. Mm -hmm. uh, the persistently infected animals, as we say, uh, develop serious disease, but the, the cats that uh, had recovered from the infection, they'd obviously been exposed in these multi-cat households, they appeared to be immune and they were perfectly healthy for the rest of their lives. So we knew that uh, cats could either become persistently infected or, or became immune. Now when the the uh, pedigree cat owners, including the Abyssinian um, Cat Association and the Abyssinian Cat Club, um, when they uh, realized that feline leukemia virus was a problem in their breed, 
they started wholesale testing of their cats and they found remarkably that about one third of all Abyssinian cats were positive for the virus they were carrying it and they determined to uh, do something about it and to eradicate it. It was interesting, they, they suffered from a number of diseases, uh, these cats that were infected, uh, and one of these was uh, infertility. And uh, afterwards it was found that in fact feline leukemia virus is associated with infertility as well as these uh, other diseases of uh, the blood forming cells. So that, that was an interesting part of, of that investigation. But uh, the, the, the Abyssinian clubs um, were very determined to, to get rid of it. And in fact, within a very short space of time, uh, it had been eradicated from, from their households. And fertility increased, and uh, they uh, lived happily ever after. <laughs> and, and this was an inspiration to the pedigree cat breeders of other breeds. And so they followed suit, and, and yes, gradually it became yes and in fact today um, uh, uh, there are hardly any pedigree cats if any which um, are which carry the virus so it has been eradicated and it's also been eradicated from many uh, households of um, domestic ordinary domestic cats as well where, where it's been found yes and rescue shelters are almost routinely in, in this country almost routinely test for Feline leukemia well, they, they test cats, um, uh, they don't test all cats now that come into the, the shelters. Um, they tend to test cats that they consider to be at high risk mm -hmm. of having an infection, uh, perhaps feral cats which they don't know the, the mm -hmm. source of them. So anything suspicious they would, uh, they, they would test uh, to make sure they were not homing cats that were going to lead to problems in the future. Mm -hmm. So, um, would you consider that eradicating FIP from the pedigree households is a possibility? I think it's a possibility, as, as you have shown in a number of, of households, but it requires um, much greater um, levels of hygiene, for example, than, than would occur with feline leukemia virus. And feline leukemia virus is transmitted um, in, in saliva. Yes. from uh, persistently infected cats to susceptible animals. So in, a, in an infected household, the um, uh, first step would be to test all of the, the cats in the household. Yes. And some would be found, would found to be positive, some negative. And uh, this is with feline, with feline, feline leukemia virus. virus. Uh, and that's a, that's a permanent state of affairs. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, fluctuation as there is with feline coronavirus where cats can recover from the infection and then be reinfected. Re mm -hmm. um, it's a much more um, black and white situation yes. with feline leukemia virus. And by testing and then separating the positive and negative cats, uh, retesting them after a period of weeks to ensure that they're still in the same state, mm -hmm. Uh, and then um, maintaining them uh, separate from each other uh, and testing any new cats that come into the household yes. to make sure they're not carrying the virus. Uh, you can maintain um, uh, households free of the virus uh, from then on because it's not easily transmitted um, indirectly. Uh, in, in indirectly as uh, feline coronavirus is. Yes. So um, quarantine as is, is very effect effective then? Yes, yes. yes. In, in fact, it's an age-old method of controlling, uh, controlling infections by yes. removing the source of the infection. And preventing it from showing up again. Yes. 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 Um, and when you said about retesting um, to make, make sure they uh, maintained the same status, what you mean is in case some, a cat is incubating, feline leukemia virus um, in the first early stages uh, um, before they become viremic for this virus in the blood. Yes, you would test the, the negatives to ensure that none of them had become positive yes. and none of them had become infected during that period um, after the first test. Yes. And you would test the, the positive cats again to make sure that none of them had recovered from the infection yes. and were now uh, immune. Yes. So it, it's uh, an insurance policy to make sure you, you really have separated the positives and the negatives.
And nowadays, of course, um, because the prevalence is so low, um, the in-house tests are very sensitive, so, so are very specific. But um, you would want to confirm any positive test. Yes, I think in crucial situations, um, a positive test should be confirmed because most, as you say, most uh, tests are done in the veterinary surgeon's uh, clinic. Mm. And uh, these tests are, are very reliable, mm -hmm. but there is, uh, because the prevalence of the infection is so low now, there is a certain level of uh, false positives. Yeah. So any uh, positive uh, test ought to be confirmed by another type of test, which is usually done in a specialist laboratory. Yes. Professor Jarrett, we're running out of time, and um, I just wondered if you had any final messages you would like to give our viewers about feline leukemia virus. Well, I, I think that um, continuing this uh, very simple strategy uh, combined with vaccination, mm -hmm. because vaccines are available uh, yes. now, and uh, if cats are going to be allowed to go out and mix with other cats in the general population, they ought to be vaccinated. It's very unlikely that they're going to be infected in that environment. Mm -hmm. But uh, vaccination is, uh, is another insurance policy against being in infected in the field. Yes. The, even the best vaccine is only just over 80% effective, isn't it? Yes, I think so uh, in, in most vaccines are not 100% uh, effective. But um, So testing is still really the way to go? Oh yes, it's the gold standard for control of this infection, yes. for sure. That's wonderful. Again, thank you so much for Pleasure. being my guest today. It's been a real honour to have you. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.